the passage we chanted just now, the Dhamma Sutta. is usually chanted on occasions related to a death. It's interesting that the, the really serious suttas like, like this one and the passages from the Abhidhamma, dependent core arising, the fire sermon, the not-self sermon, are chanted on occasions related to death. When you have a housewarming or something else that's supposed to be auspicious, there's lots about happiness and blessings. And then when a death comes, you have to get serious. Of course, if you only get serious when a death happens, it's usually too late. So it's good to be prepared, good to think about it. The Buddha has you reflect every day that you're subject to aging, illness, and death. These things are normal. Not just you, everybody. On some days you have more reason to reflect. We had two funeral chants this afternoon. One we had known that was going to happen, another than the one that just kind of came up out of nowhere. On the way back from the trip outside, we went past an accident and the car was really badly mangled. I'd be surprised if the driver survived. What they say is 250,000 people die every day. So there's plenty of occasion to think about it, and yet we tend to avoid it. Because for most people, they have no, no idea what to do. Death is one of those big mysteries, and what do you do? You die, you just die. That's the way a lot of people think about it. But the Buddha went out of his way to talk about rebirth. Death is not the end. Some people think that he picked up the teaching from his culture and hadn't really thought about it. They wonder why it might be real relevant to the Four Noble Truths or the end of suffering. But it's actually extremely relevant. For one thing, it was a hot topic in the Buddhist time. Some people thought there was rebirth, other people thought there was no rebirth. And the big question was, well, what are, is a person? such that the person could be reborn or could not be reborn. And even among the people who believed in rebirth, some said that there was no connection with your karma at all, and the rebirth just happened to follow some fate that was determined by somebody else or something else. But the Buddha's take was very different. One thing never talked about what it was that took rebirth. For him, rebirth was an action, it was something you did. And most of us do it very unskillfully. As you said, birth, rebirth, it's one of the prime instances of suffering. And because he's taught the end of suffering, an important part of his teaching had to deal with putting an end to rebirth. And because it is an action, it's something at the very least you should learn how to do skillfully. How do you develop the skill? Well, fortunately, it's the same skill as we're doing right now in meditating. Rebirth is done through craving and clinging. The Buddha's image is of a fire that can go from one house to another. And what's the bridge between the house? It's the wind. Fire clings to the wind and goes to the next house. He said in the same way, there's, there's clinging to craving that goes. And it's not going to be only at the moment of death that the craving is going to appear in the mind. The craving is appearing all the time. It's causing us to suffer in greater or less extent all the time. So fortunately, it's something we can deal with right here, right now. At the very least, you want to direct your desires in a skillful direction. This is why the Buddha has us employ desire to get the mind to settle down. That's a skillful desire. 
The desire to find awakening is a skillful desire. The Buddha encourages these things because the desire for awakening is the only thing that's going to lead to the actual awakening and to the actual end of desire. And then there's images of the desire that takes you to a, to a park. You hear that there's a spark and you want to go, and you walk there. And when you get to the park, the desire is gone because you're there. You don't need the desire anymore. So it's the same way with the path. Even though the path aims at putting an end to desire, it has to use desire to get there. So we learn how to deal with our desires and our cravings and our clings in a skillful way. So at the very least, we can manage this action of rebirth in a skillful manner. Noticing which desires are skillful, which ones are not, learning how to let go of the unskillful ones, no matter how attractive they may be. John Sawat used to speak very frequently about how it's your likes that cause suffering. Your likes and dislikes. And for most of us, that's how we define ourselves. And that's exactly how the Buddha says we define ourselves by our attachments, by our clingings and our cravings. Not only psychologically right now, but that's how we define the new identity that's going to happen after birth, after rebirth. So because it is an action, and that's how the Buddha primarily looked at it, was as an action. You want to learn how to do it skillfully. And you do it as you go through the day. Any unskillful clingings and cravings come up, you've got to learn how to let them go while you're healthy, while you're alert, while things are going well in the body. Because it's not going to be easy when things start misbehaving in the body. The liver stops functioning, or maybe your heart stops functioning, or something stops functioning. There's going to be pain. There's going to be a huge sense of frustration. You can't do the things you used to do anymore. And if your mind isn't under control, your cravings and clingings just go wild. So you've got to learn how to gain some control over them. This is another reason why the Buddha taught rebirth, because it's one of our motivations for practicing and for being really strict with ourselves as we practice. Because there are some cravings and clingings in the mind that look to be no problem at all doesn't seem to be affecting anybody else. We're okay with them. And if you think but if you think about it, these are the things that are creating not only your identity, but the world in which you're going to be reborn. It's like tuning in to a particular radio station. Whatever's on that frequency will go to that frequency. This is the kind of world you want to create, because our actions do have long-term consequences. This is another reason why the Buddha taught rebirth, is because you've got to take this into consideration when you choose to act. Every time we act, it's a gamble, it's a wager. We have choices as to what to do. Some of them are easy and pleasant, others are more difficult. And the question is, are the more difficult ones worth it? What are the long-term consequences? And how long is long-term? How far out does that go? And for a lot of people, well, as long as I can get to death, okay, that's it. And then what happens after that, it'll just take care of itself. Well, it doesn't just take care of itself. We, we're designing it right now. And so this is part of the calculation you have to make. It is a wager. Until you've gained awakening, it's going to be an uncertainty. But the Buddha said it's a wise wager to take. Because as he noted, you can't see all the results of actions here in this lifetime. Some people say, well, everything I've seen in life is enough to convince me that karma works. Well, no, it's not. You look at some people and they do all kinds of horrible, unskillful things. Yet they're still alive. They thrive. 
the Buddha has a long list of people who thrive because they kill or steal or have illicit sex or they lie or they take intoxicants. They do it with the right people and they do it in the right way. That they actually get rewarded by society one way or another. But as the Buddha said, that's, those are only the short-term consequences. You've got to take the long-term consequences in, into consideration as well. You hear, hear about people who take these classes where they say, suppose you have only one year left to live, how would you live that final year? It would be good to have a class where it's, suppose you really do get reborn, how would you live your life differently, given that assumption? That would be good practice. Because as the Buddha said, all the enlightened ones of the past, all the enlightened ones in the future, all the enlightened ones in the present all confirm that, yes, rebirth is a fact. This has nothing to do with the culture of India or the culture of America or Europe or whatever. Yet for those of us who are not yet fully enlightened or not yet even partly enlightened, it's a question mark. Can we trust them? And the Buddha said, it's a good wager. You can't just say, I don't know, and leave it at that. It's like going to a financial advisor and asking, where should I invest my money? What's going to happen with the market? And the financial advisor says, I don't know. Then you go find another financial advisor. Of course, nobody knows in the financial world, but they have ways of interpreting how things are going, and you want to find someone who's got a good track record. Because whatever you do with your money, it's a wager. If you decide not to invest it, that's a wager too, that you'd be better off by not investing it. And the same way with our actions. You can't just say, well, I don't know whether there's rebirth or not, and leave it that. Because your decision to act or your de decision not to act is a wager. Then you reach stream entry, okay, that's when you'll know for sure that the Buddha is right. There is a deathless, and the activities that have kept you from reaching that deathless have been going on for a long time, not just this one lifetime. So these are some of the reasons why the Buddha saw that was important and it was very relevant to the practice to think about rebirth. And we take it into our calculations every time we act, we make it our motivation so that we really do practice sincerely and with real determination, being very precise about what's going on in the mind. Because it is an action, it's something the mind does, and it tends to do very unskillfully, which is why it's one of the prime instances of suffering. But through the path, at the very least, we can learn how to take rebirth skillfully, and if we're really skillful, we don't have to do it anymore. So it's not just some idea that was tacked on because the Buddha wasn't thinking properly. There are so many issues in India at the time. Lots of people had lots of different ideas. And as we know from other issues, the Buddha was very particular about which issues he would address, address and which ones he wouldn't. There are a lot of hot issues in his time in India that he didn't answer at all, didn't have to take a stand on at all. But this one he chose to take a stand on in his own way. Because after all, he was teaching the end of suffering. He was teaching an action. All of his teachings are guides to action. What do we do so that we don't have to suffer? Even some of his more abstract teachings, like not-self, they're teachings about action. Self is something you do. You create a sense of self. In what ways is it skillful and what ways is it not? When is it useful to have a sense of self and when is it useful to put it away, put it aside? And it's the same about rebirth. 
how can we train the mind so that we don't have to suffer from rebirth? So at the very least we can handle the action of rebirth skillfully, and best really skillfully. So there's no more birth, and no more suffering. And the canon records the realizations that go through the mind of an arahant. The first thing that you realize after, after your realization of release is, this is the end of birth. There's no more birth. That's the first thing. So it's very relevant to our practice to take it into consideration. Because as the Buddha said, the odds of coming back with a good rebirth are pretty slim. But if we master the skills of meditation, we don't have to worry about those odds. So always keep that in mind.